On December the 21st, 1931, Time magazine published a story about Harry F. Powers, describing him as small, pudgy and pig-eyed. It's not exactly a glowing review of anyone's visage, but it is especially surprising for a man who was able to apparently attract women with ease. So numerous were his admirers that Powers had a large chunk in his home devoted entirely to storing his correspondence with eligible women across the United States. But for those unfortunate enough to begin a relationship with Mr. Powers, his less than pleasing bone structure was the least of their worries. Often dubbed the West Virginia Bluebeard, Powers lured unsuspecting women to their deaths in his underground chamber of horror. Since you're watching this, I'd wager you'd be interested in murder mysteries. If that is indeed the case, then June's Journey could be right up your street. June's Journey is a visually striking hidden object game set in the 1920s, wherein you're tasked with finding clues and completing puzzles on your quest to solve the murder of June's sister and brother-in-law. That's not all, however as there are also many other mysteries to uncover along the way. Furthermore, you'll also get to customize your island with a wide selection of items and fix up your mansion. June's Journey is free to play and is a great way to while away a few moments or dive into for a longer gaming session. So, if you'd like to join the millions of others already enjoying June's Journey, you can download the app by scanning the QR code on screen or by clicking on the link in the description box below. The man known to his neighbours as Harry Powers was born Herman Drenth in Beerte, the Netherlands, in 1892. As a young man, he emigrated to the United States, settling in Iowa with his parents before serving nearly two years overseas in World War I. By the time he returned to the US, Herman Drenth had shed his former identity entirely, instead becoming Harry Powers. Unlike his parents who clung to their native language and culture, Harry was eager to embrace the American dream by leaving his life as a poor immigrant farmer's son far behind him. And he had no desire to obtain the life he wanted through hard work alone. Instead, he took to the Lonely Hearts column in search of wealthy women. Finding a bride via newspaper advertisement was nothing new. The first known Lonely Hearts ad appeared in the 1600s, and ads seeking marriage and other relationships flourished in papers for centuries. In an era before the internet, dating apps, or 1-800 numbers, the newspaper was a lonely soul's best medium for reaching a future companion. Some ads were poetic, like the one written by a 44-year-old widow in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 1899 that read in part, would like the hearthstone of her heart swept and the cobwebs brushed away. Others were more straightforward, like this one from the Atlanta Constitution in 1898. Wealthy, lost mother, for whom I sacrificed youth, dread a lonely future, seek husband and true companion. If a fellow lonely heart spotted an ad that piqued their interest, they could write to an address provided in the ad and begin a correspondence to determine if a relationship would be mutually beneficial to both parties. While there is no way to know how many of these advertisements ended in happy marriages, there was no shortage of enthusiasm for finding love. One story in the Lincoln Star outlined how a woman from Michigan traveled to Nebraska in 1909 to meet a man she'd been corresponding with through a Lonely Hearts column. She planned to determine if they suited each other. In this case, she would marry him and take him back to her home state, where she owned a fine farm and had plenty of money. It was likely this sort of story that inspired Harry Powers 
to respond to an advertisement from a young woman named Luella Strother. Luella Strother owned a small grocery store in Clarksburg, West Virginia, and a farm in nearby Quiet Dell. Though financially comfortable, she longed for companionship and romance. When Harry Powers responded to her ad in 1927, the pair began a passionate correspondence that eventually led to a marriage proposal. 34-year-old Harry moved to West Virginia, wed Luella and settled into newlywed life in Quiet Dell. Or so it would seem, until four years later, when he was arrested for murder. One would assume that Harry's marriage to Luella satisfied his desire for comfort and status. Though Clarksburg was no roaring metropolis, it boasted a robust economy through coal and glass production, and Luella's grocery did a decent business that kept the couple insulated from many of the hardships in the early years of the Great Depression. The family's farm in Quite Dell was idyllic, settled among these smaller hills that spilled from the Blue Ridge Mountains. But Luella's matrimonial ad had sparked something in Harry. He saw how easily he could step into a life of ease and comfort. He didn't need another wife, but he wanted more money. And if he could convince other lonely women to share their wealth, all that was left to be done was dispose of the women. The Great Depression offered Harry the perfect conditions for his scheme. The collapse of the stock market and banking system meant that it wasn't uncommon for people to abruptly up sticks and leave in search of work and a better life. Families broke apart under the strain, with widespread evictions and homelessness scattering one's tight-knit circles. Young people dropped out of school and took to the road. Husbands abandoned their families, and unmarried women yearned for a way to ease the burden on their parents. It was a time of desperation and disconnection, and in it, Powers thrived. According to some accounts, he spent much of his married years on the road under the guise of traveling for business. Either while at home or away, Harry began placing matrimonial ads with the American Friendship Society. One read, Civil engineer, college education, worth $150,000 or more, has income from $400 to $3,000 per month. My business enterprises prevent me from making many social contacts. I am unable, therefore, to make the acquaintance of the right kind of women, as my properties are located through the Middle West. I believe I will settle there when married. I am an elk and a mason, own a beautiful ten-room home, completely furnished. My wife would have her own car and plenty of spending money. I'm quite tempted to answer that ad myself. The ad was signed Cornelius O. Pearson and listed a P.O. box in Clarksburg for interested parties to write to. It is not hard to imagine the kind of hope that would spark in the heart of a woman looking for love and financial stability in 1931. In the days following, the advertisement's printing powers P.O. box was inundated with up to 20 letters a day from hopeful suitors. Among them was Asta Eicher, a widowed mother of three from Park Ridge, Illinois. It remains unknown why Harry Powers selected Asta from the dozens of women who wrote to him, but the pair began a long correspondence. All the while, he was maintaining the illusion of being a faithful husband to Luella and also carrying out a construction project. At the Quiet Dell farm property seven miles from Clarksburg, Harry had contracted the building of an 18 by 20 foot building with a single room above ground and four concrete and tile rooms beneath. Luella had financed the construction to the tune of $700, some $13,000 today. 
after Harry told her he wanted a place to store vegetables. On June the 23rd, 1931, Powers, posing as Cornelius O. Pearson, arrived at the home of Asta Eicher for a short visit. He spent two days with the widow and her children, 14-year-old Greta, 12-year-old Harry, and 9-year-old Annabelle. Then the couple departed alone, leaving the children in the care of the family nurse, Elizabeth Abernathy. Five days after the pair departed, Abernathy received a letter from Asta telling her that Cornelius would come for the children soon. On July the 1st, Cornelius reappeared as promised. He sent one of the Iker children to the bank with a note and a cheque signed by Asta with instructions to fill the amount of the bank balance in on the cheque and give it to the child. However, the bank believed that the signature on the cheque was a forgery and refused to write in the amount. When the child returned home without the money, Cornelius hastily packed all three siblings into his car and drove off. Neither Asta nor her children would be seen alive again. Asta Eicher was not the only woman Harry Powers had been communicating with. Just three weeks after taking the Eicher children, Cornelius Pearson arrived at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Fleming of Northborough, Massachusetts. He had come to meet Mrs. Fleming's daughter, Dorothy Presley Lemke, whom he had been corresponding with for months. After introducing himself to Dorothy's parents, Cornelius stayed just one night before departing with his pen pal for Iowa, where they would be married. Before they left town, however, they stopped at two banks and withdrew $4,000 from Dorothy's accounts. Then they dropped her trunks off at the railway station to be shipped ahead of them. Unbeknownst to Dorothy, the trunks were not addressed to Iowa, where she believed Cornelius lived, but to Fairmont, West Virginia. Several days later, Harry Powers claimed the trunks alone. In the middle of August, Cornelius Pearson surfaced again in Park Ridge. This time, he paid a local neighbor to help him remove all of the possessions from Asta Eicher's home and listed it for rent for $75 per month. The commotion at the Eicher house aroused suspicions from other neighbors who called the police to investigate. Cornelius claimed to be managing the property on behalf of Asta and presented paperwork naming him as her agent. The police accepted his word but informed him that several hundred dollars in interest were due on the home's mortgage, which Cornelius paid from a fat roll of bills. He told the police that Asta was in Colorado and had asked him to take charge of her affairs. The Park Ridge police chief had no reason to detain Cornelius Pearson, but his suspicions were raised. No one around town seemed to have heard from the Eichers after their abrupt departure save for a school friend of Greta, who had received a letter from her pal describing what fun she was having and saying that the family was planning a trip to Europe. The letter was postmarked from Clarksburg, West Virginia. But Cornelius had said Asta was in Colorado. Probing further, the chief collected evidence from Elizabeth Abernathy, bank employees and a former boarder at the Eicher House. A search of the home revealed the love letters that Asta had sent to Cornelius and the chief decided it was time to check that the family was safe. On August 26, 1931, authorities in Illinois contacted Clarksburg Police Chief Clarence Duckworth and requested that local resident Cornelius O'Pearson be taken into custody for questioning. Of course, there was no such person in the Clarksburg area by that name. But a trip to the post office revealed that a post office box had been rented to Cornelius. The home address on file was 111 Quincy Street, where Harry Powers and his wife lived and ran their small grocery store. After it was confirmed that 
the physical description of Cornelius Pearson matched that of Harry Powers, he was arrested and detained to be questioned about the disappearance of Asta Eicher and her three children. The news of Harry Powers' arrest was reported in the Clarksburg Telegram the following day, and in a small area like Quiet Dell, it was a big story. The Harrison County Sheriff's Office received a tip from a woman whose mother's property adjoined the Strother Farm, where Harry Powers had recently built his storeroom. According to the tipster, her mother and other neighbours had noticed unpleasant smells emanating from the Strother property. The sheriff obtained a search warrant for the Quiet Dell Farm, and on August 28th, four officers pried their way into the locked garage. In the tiled rooms below ground, the officers found a bloody footprint and strands of human hair. Nearby, they recovered a partially burnt bank book. Confident that the bodies of Asta and her children must be close by, the police drained a nearby well and brought Harry Powers to the farm to show him the evidence they'd collected, but he remained silent. By 1 p.m. that afternoon, over 300 local residents had gathered at the farm drawn by the search. A 15-year-old boy told police that he had recently helped Powers dig a ditch between the garage and the creek, but it was now covered. The sheriff summoned men to help uncover it, and within minutes they unearthed the decomposing bodies of Asta Eicher and her three children. Asta and her two daughters had been strangled, while Harry had died after being struck in the head with a hammer. A fifth victim was also found with the belt used to strangle her still twisted around her neck. This was Dorothy Lemke. That night at the Harrison County Jail, Powers was subjected to hours of questioning before signing a statement confessing to the murders of the Iker family. By the time the confession was signed and the sun rose, Powers was sporting two black eyes and extensive bruising, which officials claimed were a result of falling down the stairs. At the farm, police found another child bank book with the name Dorothy Pressler Lemke. The authorities in Worcester confirmed that Dorothy had left weeks earlier and her decomposed body was identified through clothing and dental records. Inside Harry Powers' home, police uncovered a trunk filled with hundreds of letters from lonely women across the country. One writer, Edith Simpson of Detroit, had already made plans to marry Powers in the coming weeks. Her wedding dress had been purchased and she had begun planning travel arrangements. The citizens of Harrison County were infuriated by the evil that Harry Powers had brought to their quiet hamlet. On September 20th, an angry mob of nearly 5,000 surrounded the county jail and demanded that Powers be turned over to them. The siege lasted over two hours and was ended only with the use of tear gas. In the early hours of the morning, the killer was whisked away to the federal penitentiary at Moundville to await trial. But the change of venue did nothing to quell public interest in the case. Public officials rented Moore's Opera House with a seating capacity of over 500 to accommodate the spectators. The prosecution elected to try Harry Powers for the Lemke murder since there was more evidence tying him to the case. Over five days, the audience watched witnesses testify to seeing Powers and Lemke traveling together, withdrawing thousands from Dorothy Lemke's accounts and seeing Powers collect her trunks from Fairmont. After a brief deliberation, the jury returned a guilty verdict and on December the 12th, 1931, Harry Powers was sentenced to death by hanging at Moundsville State Penitentiary. In the days before his execution, he was accused of being responsible for other murders, including that of Dudley Wade, 
a carpet sweeper salesman and former co-worker of Harry's who had disappeared in 1928. There was also speculation that he may be responsible for dozens more lonely heart killings, given his high volume of correspondence. But those accusations remain unproven. At 9am on March the 18th, 1932, Powers mounted the gallows in the yard of Moundsville Penitentiary. Before a guard slipped the black death cap over his head, he was asked if he wanted to make a final statement. But the man who had written millions of words of love and promise to hundreds of women was silent at last. Thank you for watching and thanks once again to this episode's sponsor, June's Journey. You can download the game for free right now by using the link in the description. Right then, take care and I'll see you next time with another story that will make you say, well, I never.